Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Bread of Life channel. I'm so excited to be here with Glenda today. Uh, Glenda is a Christian Buddhist, and she's going to be talking about um, her beliefs and her perspective. Welcome, Glenda. Thanks a ton. Yeah, so glad you're here. And just for a little background, Glenda and I met about a month ago at a furniture store and we just hit it off so much. I couldn't even shop because I was just <laughs> so focused on uh, having a great conversation with Glenda. So um, anyway, it was really wonderful to meet her. And, and so now I'm glad that you're here on the channel. And so can you start out by sharing with us a, a bit about yourself and your religious background? Yeah, so I was raised by conservative Christians, sort of fundamentalists. They're really like 14th century Christians, hellfire and damnation. Uh, and I latched onto that very early and read the Bible when I was 11 very carefully. And I was comparing things like Jeremiah to Deuteronomy in my head um, and memor sort of memorizing the Bible. Uh, and also studying world history like a, like a maniac at the same age. And by the time I was a teenager, I was going to any church I could go to. And my parents were worried that I was going to turn out to be a heretic. Uh, I went to a um, mosque. I had an opportunity to go to a mosque. That was fabulous. And I went to the synagogue with my Jewish friend. And so I'm a metaphysical aficionado, you could say, I guess. But I do have a long history, and uh, I, I studied Judaism really carefully, and the, then I went to Buddhism uh, in my early 20s and just fell into that like a fish into water <clears throat> and sort of returned to Christianity. Later, I was a Unitarian for quite a while, so I went to Unitarian Church for a long time. Wow. And when you say we, are you talking about, who are you talking about there? Uh, we, I can't even remember when I said we, so. Uh, you said we, we were going to a Unitarian church. Oh, yeah. Your husband, your. Yeah. Well, I was, I took everyone. I, I made everyone tag along with me. So I took my family to the Unitarian church. Uh-huh. And worship. Oh, wow. But it's really just a social justice organization. It's not really a religion per se in my mind. I think it used to be different a century ago. So it was fascinating, but I felt like it had lost touch with the original roots of religion and Christianity. And so I stopped attending because I'm really a believer. And I felt like it was a place for rootless agnostics to hang out together, <laughs> to find community, which isn't a bad thing. It was fine. And yeah. it drew people from all over the spectrum of religion, a lot of experimental minds. It was quite wonderful. There's a lot of great people that go to the Unitarian Church. So it was fun. Cool. So you were, you said you, like you were raised in a fundamentalist home, but did you kind of influence your parents away from some of those ideas? Mm, no, tragically, they're still super fundamentalist. Uh, I haven't been able to talk to them about religion since I was a teenager. And so because I bless them where they are, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. But our paths diverged and... I understood their position extremely well, and I had a lot of conversations with my father about religion. When I was eight or nine, I stopped. Um, I started worrying about uh, the end of times, and I was grappling with the question about whether or not we could actually be saved if, if damnation and hell was a real thing. I was like, well, why would God create us? This is what I was thinking about when other kids were riding their bikes at eight and nine. I was like, why would God create us to be destroyed by sin and damnation? I couldn't reconcile it. And I was wondering things like, is it possible to live a perfect life? Or what is what is this whole paradigm about? And so I rejected parts of it wholesale and embraced other parts of it. And I became quite an agnostic Christian. I've always been a believer, always. But I didn't know what the faith should look like. And I also believed, decided early, pretty early in my mid-teens, probably that no one really, everyone was talking from a storyline and I couldn't embrace the same storyline because they were interpreting. So I got really interested in discovering what Christ actually taught, not what people said he taught. Who was he? What did he really teach? That I got sort of obsessed with that question. And so where did that obsession take you? What did you learn that he actually mm -hmm. teaches? 
Um, so the core of his message, as far as I can tell, is um, self-examination and self-reflection. Um, don't create a show for other people to observe and experience. Uh, hypocrisy will always catch up with you. Be authentic and search for the creator. And, and that's how I've lived my life. Um, I have reverence for the creation. I don't know the form of the creator. Um, my worry has always been, I have a philosophy degree and I, I knew a lot of atheists and agnostics and I couldn't talk to them about religion because they were pretty enthusiastic about atheism. But one question I always asked everyone is, since we're inside this, the construct and we are sort of an electromagnetic frequency band, a narrow band of light, and we can't perceive anything outside that, how can we have final answers? And they could never answer my question. So since we don't have those final answers, we just do the best we can with the information we have. And I feel that's true for everyone in the world is doing the best they can with the information they have, Christians and non-Christians, atheists and agnostics, everybody. Because we don't know, we're winging it, aren't we, to some extent? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> For a while I was kind of agnostic too. I gave up on Christianity because I couldn't find good information. I studied early church fathers. I'm still studying that. I'm going to read the Apocrypha. I haven't read that. I'm reading something else right now. So I hope to, I'm constantly revisiting the question, what is Christ? Who was he? What did he teach? What did he not teach? What's an accretion from later on? Yeah. Now, what does it mean that you're a believer? Like when mm -hmm. you say that, what are you believing in? Mm -hmm. I always knew God was real and that we were part of a creation and a grand design. That was, that's always been true from my, <clears throat> from the time I was four, five, six, I knew. So when people say they believe in God, I was like, yeah, of course, of course, God's real. Now, what is God? That's open for a discussion. Uh, do we know what God wants us to do? That's also open for discussion. But are we created by a creator and a grand design? Of course, that's what I mean by, by a believer. And, and I always- What makes you Jesus. sure about that? I mean, I feel the same way. I'm not right, at all challenging right. this because I've always felt the same right. way. But I, I'm just I, wondering what, for those who don't automatically have that. Have that yeah. I, I have a lot of compassion sure? for people who don't know that because mm -hmm. I know that it's hard one for many people. I've had a lot of conversations with people who don't have that knowledge. I'm not sure why. I just think it's built into my DNA. Um, I have had some experiences. I had an experience when I was eight years old with an angel. Uh, when I was worried about hellfire and damnation and I couldn't sleep and I was awake all night, a, a presence came into my room. I wasn't planning on sharing that. I almost never tell anyone. Uh, but that was a visitation of some kind of presence that let me know that all was well and that everything was proceeding according to plan. So I have had that experience. Um, it's just innate. I know God exists. When I uh, was traveling through Greece, um, I saw um, an Orthodox priest blessing a member of his parish. And I waited patiently uh, till the priest was free. And then I approached him and asked if he would give me a blessing also. And he looked me in the eye very sternly and he said, are you a believer? And I said, yes, yes, Father. So he bestowed that beautiful Orthodox um, blessing on me. So I don't know, I'm just part of the community of faith, kind of a drifter, kind of on the outside, a little bit of a maverick, I guess. <laughs> so what does it mean that you're a Christian Buddhist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're actually in different realities. I would say, since I study metaphysics continually, that Christianity, as it's expressed, again, not what the original Christians were, but our understanding of Christianity or the history of Christianity over the many centuries, is kind of a fourth dimensional faith. It's a brain centered, uh, discussional faith where people split hairs over what's real. Now, that's not as true now as it was a few generations ago, where people were always slaughtering each other over these questions. Like the Byzantine Empire almost fell five or six times over this kind of stuff. You know, is the nature of Christ innately divine or is it whatever, whatever? And they, they attacked each other and excommunicated each other over these ideas. Buddhism is kind of the opposite of that. Uh, Buddhism is a story about re the relief of suffering and living a noble life. So the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. Um, and when people asked him about God, he said, our job is not to talk about God. Our question is how to relieve suffering. So go back and sit on your meditation cushion and meditate. Uh, so he didn't, even, he didn't even talk about God. However, Buddhism has also become like Christianity. Mahayana Buddhism has a heaven and a hell. It has demons. It has kind of saints. 
Um, I'm a Theravada Buddhist, which is a strictly meditational monastic kind of Buddhism where you just sit on the cushion and you let your mind quiet so you can shift and change and become self-aware, which is where it dovetails with Christianity pretty beautifully in my mind. And when did you discover Buddhism and really get into practicing it? So when I was a teenager, so I spent all my teen years reading books. I did actually attend school, right? But other than that, I just read. You know, I still do that. I read thousands of pages a month on many topics. Um, I read about Buddhism when I was around 15, and I, I wanted to be a Buddhist instantly. I was studying a history of far, the Far East. It was one of those 3,000-page books. Cambridge history, the middle of the Far East or something. And I read stories about how the um, the yogis would sit in the snow and they'd have a contest to see who could melt the most snow by sitting in the snow drifts. Uh, they'd go, they'd soak themselves in water, sit there without any robes and then melt snow by meditating. I was like, I want to do that. That's the coolest thing of all time. Um, so then one of my friends asked me to go to the Zendo. I was around 20 I was like, yeah, that's the coolest thing ever. So I went to the Zendo and then I started getting up and going to the Zendo at 5.30 in the morning to meditate, even though I'm a night owl. And I, I, I've been an enthusiastic practitioner for about 15 years. Uh, practice means you just sit though. That's what Zazen means. Um, so it's kind of an agnostic practice where you self-reflect, you allow things to occur to you. You discover the difference between yourself and your mind, uh, between yourself and your ego. That's one of the best parts of the practice, because when I know myself, I can I can distinguish between my own mind and my ego ch chattering at me. And Christianity doesn't t teach that practice, which is a great liability to the tradition, not to not to the faith, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, in the chat, someone asked uh, Jamie Russell asked, uh, you know, which what part of your beliefs are Christian? What do you believe uh -huh. about Jesus Christ? Uh -huh. Do you believe like he was crucified and, you know, that he rose from the dead and he's the savior of the world? I'm positive that he's the savior of the world. Um, and I would go to my death to to the same as ancient Christians did uh, for that testimony that he is in some way a creator, creator son of the universe. There's I read constantly and I'm not sure. I think that uh, the jury's out for me about uh, those traditional Christian things. Some of them to me, I gave up on Christianity and walked away for a few years, uh, but I, my, I never lost my faith. I just didn't know what form it should take. So I'm not going to be I'm not going to argue with others about a belief system when I'm not sure myself. One thing that really had a huge impact on me is when I traveled the world, I went to all these Christ, ancient Christian churches like the one in um there's a bunch in Jerusalem that are 15, 1600 years old easily. And they all have the same story where all these people were living a normal life, da, 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 going about their business. Then they hear the message. It changes their life. And the Romans come and round them up and they're ready to execute everybody. And they go, sure. And they let themselves be slaughtered. And every church, old church I went to, they always had stories like that. And I was like, who was this guy that did this thing? Right. So whether he's resurrected, uh, will I be resurrected? I, I, I'm peaceful not knowing the answer to that question. I know that it will be revealed to me in good time. I think if I needed to know now, I'd already have an answer. If that mm. makes sense. I'm sort of an agnostic. Yeah. OK. So what do you think the other options are? Like if that's not what's going on, mm -hmm. like what do you think? You know, do you think reincarnation? Because I know Buddhism is kind of, you know, big on reincarnation. So is yeah. that one of your beliefs? Well, actually, I've worked for years as a professional psychic. I don't know if you and I talked about this when we had our in-person conversation. Uh, and the reason that I'm, I believe in reincarnation is not, not because I'm attached to a belief system, but because I've had so many experiences as a psychic where something pops up from another lifetime. And I say, da, da, da. And the other person goes, oh, that's funny because of this and that. So everybody corroborates that these stories are... Uh, that they've had these previous experiences. An example is I was talking to this woman about this thing where she was a storyteller in ancient Africa and she would go from village to village and tell the stories of the people. And she had this carved staff that was, and I said, let me draw you the staff. She goes, no, you don't need to. I carved that staff when I was 12. I was like, what? I mean, so I believe in reincarnation for the same reason I believe in other things that it's a great hypothesis. 
Um, it also makes sense of things like why did Mozart compose at age three? And why was, why was there a mathematician born in central India who could do uh, theorems when he'd never been exposed to mathematics? So kind of, I, I theoretically believe in reincarnation. Uh, and I also believe that myself, I've been a monk or a nun in, in monasteries in the East and West for many thousands of years. And that's my favorite gig is to be a, a monk. I live a monastic life kind of now in a way, but I, and I believe, but I, I also think that anything can be uh, overturned by sufficient proof, uh, like Galileo, right? So theoretically, I believe in it. I think it's real. I don't know. I can't see outside the goldfish bowl. I just live in the goldfish bowl. Um, there's a lot of, I think, one of the theories I've heard of was that Christ is a creator son who comes from the infinite universe. Uh, I study a lot of um, quantum th physics or theoretical physics. And I wonder if he, he was sent for some reason to this specific world as some sort of creator God incarnate. So that I believe for sure. And I, I, I know that in some way, but the details about, uh, you know, the Pentecost and um, rising, raising people from the dead. I don't know. I, I just don't know. <laughs> now you said you study theoretical physics. That's yeah. not, you know, I mean, that's kind of like an uncommon thing for people to get deeply interested if it's not their field. So what um, have you learned from that? Like, can you talk about how that really applies more? Like, mm -hmm. in yeah. Great question. It's, it's kind of out there. I know. So theoretical physics, things like what is the nature of a human being? So my real passion is what is a human being? Why do we take this form and how did we come to be? Right. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting hints in theoretical physics. Like for example, we know now that we're part of an electromagnetic spectrum and we reside on this little itty bitty part of slice of that electromagnetic spectrum. And what we can see and perceive only falls within that narrow band and everything on the ultraviolet and infrared is unknown to us. Um, and I, I believe that in, there's all kinds of things going on in the universe. Uh, it's an awfully big universe for just one planet with a bunch of people on it. Um, and I think that there's all kinds of life forms that God has created and that the, my, my working theory is that God created all kinds of beings, uh, with all kinds of lives and we all give glory to the same creation and we're expressions of the creation and the purpose of our being is discovery and expansion and compassion and kindness. And these are all things that Jesus encouraged people to, to look into. Um, and he also knew that he was connected to the infinite creator and he shared that in no uncertain terms. So, mm. <clears throat> but I, now, I go ahead. Sorry. Do you think the, the, that Christianity and Buddhism harmonize? Like, oh, yeah. do you think, okay. <laughs> what, what do you think are the points of agreement between Christianity and Buddhism? Well, so funny thing, if you, if you took a fundamentalist Buddhist to like a Mahayana who believes in heaven, hell and demons, uh, and you took a fundamentalist Christian and you put them in the same room, they'd probably be jumping on each other in 10 minutes and, and arguing and fighting about what's real. Mm -hmm. But if you put a theoretical physicist in the same room with a Zen Buddhist like me, taught in the white plum lineage, where the Buddha said, we don't talk about God, we just talk about the cessation of sufferings and the four noble truths, right? Right thought, right action, right speech, right action. Um and you focus on that and being compassionate and living a kindly, loving and compassionate life. That's kind of the core of the Christian teachings when you strip away all the accretions over all the centuries. Right. So in my mind and also um, I would say Buddhism deals with the fifth dimension and Christianity deals more at the fourth dimension, going back to that metaphysical or string theory kind of reality layer, um, because the fourth dimension, as I understand it, which is not very well has to do with the, the um, discussion of ideas, parsing out of reality, structural reality, stories about structural reality, disagreeing about details needing to be right. It's more of a discovery of what is real in the mental space, which has its place. It's an important part of life. Uh, Buddhism is transcendent. It goes right to fifth dimension. When you sit on the Zen cushion and your mind goes to perfect stillness, it is the most blissful, quiet thing in the universe. And you see that there's one of the things my Roshi taught is you can distinguish the one who is sitting from the one who is beyond that one. So that's, I think, Nirvana. Nirvana is I am not this one on the cushion. 
And that's that's the whole point of sitting is to experience that one who's not the person sitting, whose mind is stuck in fourth dimension. Oh, you know, what about this detail? Should I solve that? Were these people right? Was I right? Da, da, da. All that stuff is fourth dimensional. But Zen allows you to escape it. And is that, are those the kind of things that you said you walked away from Christianity for a while? Mm -hmm. And was it really like the infighting and that kind of stuff that drove you away from it? Was mm -hmm. that... What was, mm -hmm. what were the things that took you away from it? Because I knew that no story could ever be true. So that's a very Zen concept, what I just said. Um, even my own stories, my own stories are based on my perspective, my own understanding, by where I grew up, uh, the culture that I live in, the blind spots of my culture, the artificial certainties of my own mind and the world around me. Um, and I've always been drawn to those things that are beyond the stories that are temporal. So I've traveled all over the world and I've watched closely and I watch for the blind spots and the universality and consciousness. And this is my favorite thing is to figure out what humans really are. So there's a lot of universality and there's a lot of cultural stuff. So I didn't really walk away. I just thought, well, can't, since I can't solve who Christ was, and since I don't believe religion expresses the truth of his message very well, um, I'm just going to sh shelve it and practice self-reflection and integrity. And then I just fell right into Buddhism as an expression of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I see. So uh, um, it probably seems like two sides of the, you know, two parts of the football field, but to me, it's all one football field. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So then do you think like all religions are equal, all religions are, you know, but like, how do you view other religions like Hinduism mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, Islam? And so for a long time, I, that's a great question. Uh, for a long time, I practiced Christianity with a sort of agnostic quietude. So I was practicing because I felt I could contribute. I was practicing because I felt I could help others. I wanted to learn about Christ and spread his good news as best I could. Um, and some uh, Jehovah's Witnesses came to my house one day and I invited them in for a little chat and they said, da da da, hellfire damnation, good guys, bad guys. And I said, what about a Chinese guy who everybody in the village loves him? He's been loving and compassionate his whole life. Uh, the rapture happens, the heavens roll open like a scroll. He falls to his knees and says, oh, there's the God I always knew was there. I said, what about that guy? And they were like, uh, uh, uh. So I was that kind of a Christian for decades, really, 20 years probably. Um, but you asked about the, I feel that God presents to us the stories that we can readily assimilate and relate to that bring us to the best joy and the closest opening to, to the crack into heaven that we can get to. So no, no one knows we all fall short of the glory of God, right? Including me, of course. Um, I'm just looking for the expression that feels like it's most resonant with the truth that has been revealed to me. And I also believe that everyone is doing the best they can in that way. I believe that everyone's a child of God. So, uh, I studied Islam when I lived in the Middle East and everybody said the Quran this and the Quran that. So I pulled out the Quran, I read the whole thing and I compared it to the other faiths. I think they all have their strengths and weaknesses because of human culture. Um, I don't think that anyone's inherently more righteous than others, although the jury's out on that. That's I don't know if I'm right about that at all. I think some people are much more gracious and holy than others. I'm just as confused. Uh, you know, I've, I'm recently studying the lives of the saints of the Middle Ages. I've got a biography of Bernard of Clairvaux, and I'm reading that, and Julian of Norwich, and I was reading about Joan of Arc today. And everybody's doing the best they can you know, trying to find God or trying to find truth or trying to find meaning. And it's a struggle and people suffer. And it's it's a frightening abyss that we face when we don't have any answers. So I know religion provides comfort and I think that's great. Cool. So you were talking about how in meditation, you kind of, you get to this place where you realize you're not the person on the cushion. Yeah. And so what I would like to understand from this is, like, how do you view your essential self? Do you huh. like, okay, I'll just leave it at that. That's such a great question. Yeah, I, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for asking me. Oh yeah, uh, sure. I'm having a great time too. Good. Uh, so I am the one that has no form. 
uh, part of me is incarnate in this being. I don't know what the rest of me looks like. Um, it is a person who is not this one sitting here. Because I've been meditating now about 15 years or so. Have you heard about the UCLA studies with the brain chemistry where I'll just summarize 30 second summary. Uh, people who've meditated 20 years or more have an 800% change in brain chemistry as opposed to ordinary folk. People who've meditated five years or more have a 400% shift. Um, it changes your beta waves to more alpha and delta waves. Uh, and so then that places you out in the realm, the 5D reality that's not this 3D dimensional reality. So it makes me a person who plays in the reality. I'm like, if part of me is not even here because I'm just an electromagnetic frequency on a band in a three-dimensional world God created to play in or learn in or whatever is going on here, um, can, I, how, can I bend through the reality to make it correspond more closely to the larger dimensional reality? 11th dimension, 12th dimension, the realm of God, whatever that is, the realm of the angels, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I'm a person playing in a realm that God created for us all to discover as much as we can and spread as much light as we can. Now, what, what does it mean to spread light? What does mm -hmm. that? Just be nice to people. Be nice. I would like, actually, what I'd like to do, I had a practice for a few years where I had a lot of dreams. I have a lot of dreams and sometimes visions or prophetic dreams. I've always had those. Uh, one of those, I had a series of dreams that I was made empty and the spirit of God could flow into me so it could walk in the world in my, in my feet as I walked in the world. And so then I began praying and I said, help me to exemplify the goodness of God in every action and word and thought as best I can to bring relief to the suffering of others. So that's again a place where Christianity dovetails with the Buddhism for me. I care greatly about the relief of suffering in the human world. I know humans suffer greatly for many reasons, some of which are real, some are self-imposed, mm -hmm. some have to do with the existential truth of being a human. Um, and I just like people to feel that they're not alone and that the light of God can flow into their life at any moment they could experience grace. So I'd like to be one who shares grace the way that you light a torch in a dark room. That's that's my goal. Cool. That's so beautiful. <laughs> um, now, what are the what are the qualities that you like? How do you understand God? Hmm. Like, so, what is his nature like? Uh, infinite grace and lo infinite loving kindness and infinite patience. One of the things I say to my friends when they struggle. So I try to be that little voice of kindness when people come to me. People have always come to me and said, even strangers, you know, I don't know why they'd be brought to me. You probably have this experience. I think you and I talked about this, right? Someone approaches you because they know they can ask and you answer like the holy question, right? The holy question, they bring it and then you answer it. I, I too have that experience. Um, so the nature of God is infinite. And I think that God is infinitely more patient than we anticipate. And I, I feel sorry for the people in the Middle Ages who came to blows and excommunicated one another one another over the nature of God. Um, but when I'm in the meditative state and it's a state of pure stillness, my impression is that the universe is infinitely fertile with possibility, but it's a neutral consciousness underpinned by an infinite love and softness and compassion and power. So that's my closest approximation to the nature. And I feel that Jesus, when he came into the world, exemplified that energy and people could feel it when they, when they met him. That's what, yeah. that's who I feel he was. He, he was that creator walking in the world with the energy of God, infinite reality blowing open on the planet. And I think that's why people willingly sacrifice their lives and why Peter said, I'm not worthy to be killed in the same way. So if you have to crucify me, hang me upside down. I mean, something drove those people to those crazy. Who would do that in your sane mind? Oh, sure. Go ahead and slaughter me. Throw me to the lions. Okay. I mean, why do you do that? Because you have some experience of the universe so vast that it doesn't matter to you if you die. And that's yeah. what I'm That's what I'm running after. That's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And actually, now there's a couple things here. I'm, I haven't been paying too much attention to the chat, guys. I'm really glad you're here, but I've been just focused on what Glenda's saying. But I did see these comments come up that I want to put up. So do you, so I said his mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agreed to that, but this person mm -hmm. wants to know. So do you think God is male? I would say God is all. 
So God could have male presence manifestations or female presence manifestations. When I had a visitation as a child, as a seven-year-old, I experienced an angelic personage, but I'm pretty sure that was filtered through what my consciousness could hold. Like it's God's not going to manifest to me as like a, a Hinduist deity because I wouldn't know what to do with it, what to do with that. And one of the things that I've heard people say is that God's presence manifests in a form that we can recognize so we can feel comfort. Um, I would say God is beyond gender and God sometimes is manifest in a female energy and sometimes in a male energy. So then do you believe that like the gods people worship in Hinduism are mm -hmm. real manifestation manifestations of the creator? Uh, yeah, I do. Actually, I wrote a paper when I was a senior in high school comparing Buddhism and Hinduism because it's that passion that I have to unearth all the truth about God as fast as possible. Uh, and one of the things that I've heard a Hindu scholar say about it is that the like Ganesh, the one with the elephant tusks or Shiva or whatever, I had dreams about Shiva when I was a six year old. He was moving in stop motion in my dreams. Uh, this is and I think that's karmic for me. I think that flows in from other lifetimes um, where I've had other experiences of God. But anyways, uh, the, the Hindus say that the God symbolizes a truth and that people of whatever faith level can travel that path and arrive in the presence of God so they can find peace, comfort, joy, hope, and um, confidence that life is meaningful and their life matters. And I, I feel that uh, God will touch each, like I, I have a personal practice of speaking to people in their own language because I can read their energy field, I can see their aura, but I speak to them in their language. I don't try to speak to them in my language. That wouldn't be nice. And I think God speaks to us in our language. Well, how many languages do you speak? Oh, I'm working on my fourth, I think it is. Yeah, I'm French is my, I'm studying French right now. And I think it's my fourth foreign language. I've studied uh, German, Spanish, and Turkish. I speak oh, Turkish. wow. Yeah. Wonderful. But I think God's like that. So God knows what language you speak and will speak to you in that language. So all people have to do is open with some quietude and patience and allow the insight to flow in. And then I think they too can have that personal experience of the creation, just as you and I have had. And somebody asked me years ago, why can't I hear God? I'm so tormented, I can't hear God. And I said, sweetie, you need to allow silence. Because if you're talking, it's a one-sided conversation. How can God answer you? Okay, so here was the other question I wanted to highlight. Where <laughs> B.S. Lewis asks, where's the wrath? And by mm. the way, he's an atheist, so he actually yeah. doesn't believe in this. Yeah. But I think he just wants to know, we, you know, there's this biblical concept of God's judgment and his yes. wrath for sinners. Yeah. Now, how do you perceive that? Oh, thanks for asking me that. Um, I rejected and walked away from that God when I was around 16 or so. I felt like the God of the Old Testament, sorry for all the believers, uh, looks like a psychopath or sociopath. Um, I was uh, reading Marcion. I read about Marcion, who was one of the first Christians. He was second generation, taught by the original apostles. And he was very passionate about the Old Testament not being included in the Christian scriptures. And he was hounded out of town and they called him a heretic and rejected what he said. But I feel maybe he was right because um, I feel like a lot of atheists or agnostics that the stories in the Old Testament are residues of other stories from other cultures. I'm always studying ancient religion. I'm going to get a PhD in mimetic theory, which is the, like early observation of religion from prehistoric times. I, I agree. I don't believe in the hellfire, wrath and damnation story that I was, uh, was drummed into me as a kid. It, it's not coherent. Um, and I could be wrong, but it doesn't make sense that would God would create a whole universe of beings and then damn most of them for being wrong in some way. That's an incoherent belief system. So for atheists to be, uh, not, uh, a, a, be, to be atheist for that reason makes perfect sense to me. And if I hadn't had a direct experience of God, I could, I'd be an even more vehement agnostic than I am. But so I get the wrath. I get it. It's, it's, okay. it's incoherent. Okay. Is it incoherent um, because of E the idea of eternal conscious torment or is it incoherent because it's just it wouldn't be fitting for god to judge 
creatures? Uh, God created us. So if God wants to judge us, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? It makes sense. I don't have a problem with that. And I also think that I have just a human mind. So how would I fathom the nature of God? I, I just feel that I can't, I can't fathom the nature of God. Um, but that whole story about creating and then judging, he just looks like an angry narcissist to me in the old Testament. And I, I was very, I kept that to myself all through my teens and I would, I'd ask people about it and I quickly discovered they hadn't read the whole Bible. They didn't know that that was going on or I just felt like that part of it, cause I've studied religion almost daily for my entire life. So I think that those are somebody's best effort to understand the whole story and to offer it as honorably as possible. But I, I personally don't accept that uh, those stories taught anciently about God make sense. Uh, but the nature of God that he's infinite and glorious and that somebody was trying to capture that and write it down, I feel they were filtering it as best they could. They did their most, they did their most authentic, they created their most authentic effort to, to tell the truth. And they just didn't know. And they, and I also think there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that wrath story that I think go back into the mists of time, which is why I want to do a PhD in mimetic theory, which talks about the wrath of God. Uh, human sacrifice and animal sacrifice is based on that notion of a wrathful God. Um, I could talk about that for a while because I've studied it in tremendous detail. So I think it's more of a residual story than a true story. But I again believe it was offered with integrity. So I'm not going to fault people who lived thousands of years ago who didn't understand God. They did the best they could. One thing that I've discovered recently, I was studying Babylonian religion recently, just for the heck of it, right? Um, was that the early Babylonians built the star charts and did all this uh, 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 animal sacrifice because they were reading the augers and the livers of sacrificed animals. And they had this complicated thing and they wrote these gigantic volumes about it. Basically, they were afraid you could offend the gods at any moment. You wouldn't know why something bad would happen and you had to constantly placate them. And I felt so much compassion for them because they didn't even know why God was angry, why a destruction was happening. They believed that up through the Middle Ages. People were terrified they were going to offend God. And I feel sad humans have suffered under those feelings for so long. Even our wonderful Puritan ancestors in the U.S. believe that. And I, I think it's safe to let those beliefs go. I don't think they correspond with the truth of things. Now, a lot of people have asked me that, why would God allow so much confusion to exist about his nature? Hmm. I love your questions, by the way. These are genius questions. Uh, we get to find <laughs> this. What is the purpose here, it's right? My audience. <laughs> we must have a brilliant audience too then, yes? Uh, so we're just thrown here into this uh, playground and we get to have an adventure here. That's my view. That's sort of my metaphys metaphysical view. Why would God spoil the fun by telling us how it is when we're having a lot more fun figuring it out in the, on the blind? I mean, isn't it a grand adventure to come here being part of the nature of God, the infinite universe, a sliver of the divine consciousness separated from itself um, and to play with who am I and who are you and what is this and what are we and who are we? What a blast. I mean, I think it would spoil the fun. It would be like telling someone the end of the story if God were to reveal. And also then I think it would give us a false sense. I think that we're creating the nature of reality as we exist. That's another one of my beliefs, which is not necessarily Christian, not necessarily Buddhist, that we're creating the reality and expanding God. Um, and God is participating with us in the expansion that we're creating. And there's no wrath in there except our wrath against one another and our fear of getting it wrong. Well, what about all of the suffering that has occurred mm -hmm. because of confusion? Like, do you True. think, do you, how do you feel about, you know, like when violent acts take place and things like mm -hmm. that, like a lot of people would say, well, this isn't a blast. Like millions of people right. have died over ideas. Oh, you're right. There's no question. So I, I probably read 5,000 pages a, a month mm -hmm. on all these topics. Right. And I just, I'm sick of, I'm sick of the human race being so violent. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Bishop marches into a town he slaughters everyone in town. He crucifies these people. He, whatever, whatever. It's endless. It just goes on and on. I hate that part of human nature. 
Um, I have a theory, it's a working theory, that this planet is an anomaly in the universe and that there is something to that story in the Old Testament about this world being a fallen world, and the jury's out on that. I've read the Orontia book, which talks about that fallen state. Um, I heard something recently on that question, which was that even though this is a fallen world, and again, that's hypothetical. I have no way of knowing if that's a true story. It just feels right. Um, if it's a fallen world and there's evil going on here, one of the reasons we've been allowed to fend for ourselves in this uh, larger existential picture is because more righteousness than evil has been created here. For example, Joan of Arc. I don't know if the people know about her. You should read up on her. Oh, I love her. She's, she's one hero. of my heroes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's right up there with Nelson Mandela or the Buddha or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just extraordinary in so many ways. But you create righteousness like that. That's a glorious beam of light that shoots out into the whole universe, changes the whole nature of reality. If we're creating it on an electromagnetic spectrum, maybe the virtue and triumph and righteousness created here affects all of the creation out to the furthest reaches of the multiverse. And that's, so we can't see it from where we're standing and it's horrifying to witness and sickening to know about, but maybe it's part of a greater good. So that ancient argument about, you know, if God is omnipotent, why does he allow suffering? Well, I used to not be able to sleep at night because I was worried about that, honestly. <laughs> but uh, so. So how did it get, settled for you? Like mm -hmm. one point in your life, were you mm. up at night thinking about it? And then how did that get settled? Right. I, I mean, I, my, when I did my, uh, my degree in philosophy, that was my senior seminar question, this question of suffering and the omnipotence of God. And we couldn't solve it any more than the great theologians of the middle ages solved it. For me, Buddhism was part of that answer. Uh, because Buddhism allows you to experience what's transcendent, slip out of the here and now, see that you are not this one sitting. I am not this one driving the car stuck in traffic. I am not this one worrying about, you know, 50 cents too much in the shopping, you know, in the, in the supermarket. I am not that one. I am part of the ineffable, ineffable reality. And we are all in this beautiful game together. And the, the light of God shines through people's faces. I see that. I think you probably do, too. Um, Buddhism, I think, solved it for me. Uh, but I, I made my peace because I thought, well, if I don't know, and if good is arising out of the creation, and there's a bigger picture here, which I can't see from inside the sandbox or the narrow spectrum of electromagnetic mm -hmm. frequency, um, then I don't need to worry about it. If God is at peace with the creation, self-destructing or the brutality of the creation, who am I to argue with that? There's also a teaching in karma that all that goes around comes around. I'll give you a brief example. Um, I have, there's craziness in my family, right? Like a lot of people, I have, there's a lot of crazy. And my father's a very difficult person. Sorry, dad. Uh, but I, I asked my angels about it years ago. And the answer that I received was he's in a judgment retribution model of the universe. Later on, I started having flashbacks. And I saw my father as someone who'd burned me at the stake in the Middle Ages in Germany just to throw all this out on the table for people to just kind of chew on. Uh, and I didn't know it was Germany until I lived in Germany and I recognized the layout of the land there. Uh, he, he murdered me in effect and now has to be my father and he has to come to terms with me. And one of the things that I've seen in my psychic readings over the last 20 years is karma's there, folks. If you screw up, you're going to self-destruct. A lot of people who self-destruct are paying for a crime they've committed on the soul level. Uh, even children who die in childhood, my theory is that they have that's a recompense for evil they've created. There's a lot of accrued karma in the world, and it's just part of the unfolding nature of reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, but do you think, because see, to me, that idea kind of like is, make would make people less compassionate mm. or, you know, that, that seems to be um, a problem for compassion because then if someone's suffering, then you're thinking, well, that's their rep retribu retribution, oh, retribution and you don't, and you don't help them. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I do. And, and I mean, it seems like that is something that does happen in countries that believe in, you know, in places oh, yeah, like in India. Different. Mm -hmm. Never go to India. If you've never been there, don't go. It's heartbreaking because they believe that and they just leave people to fend for themselves. The things you see on the street there are shattering. 
I traveled all over the world when I went to India. It was shattering to watch the suffering there. It just, I couldn't bear it. It was excruciating. Um, but anyway, you're right. Um, but the problem is, is we're always interpreting through the lens of invisibility. Like one of my favorite concepts in Buddhism, Buddhism is the idea of I don't know mind. I'm not the creator. I don't know. What are, what's my best guess? What's my hunch? What's my experience guiding me toward? Um, I think in the, in the here and now, we can't bear suffering because it's excruciating to watch, especially people that look innocent like children or violence and war. It's excruciating. Um, in the larger context, is there, a, is there a poetic clarity that emerges? If you have 300 lives to play with, just like in a video game, uh, this one you blow up and then the next one you blow somebody up, etc. Maybe there's a bigger picture answer to the question of suffering. But the jury's out for me because, again, I'm stuck in the narrow band of frequency. I can't see the whole, con the whole context. All I can see is the glimpses I get from past life readings which encouraged me to believe that if you do screw up stuff in another lifetime, you will pay for it. And no one has to do anything to it. It just happens. My role is to be compassionate no matter what. I know every soul is struggling with difficult things. So if someone was terrible in another lifetime, I would never hold that against them. Now, I was probably terrible in another lifetime too. It's not my place to judge them. I mean, Jesus said, who's, you know, who's sinless cast the first stone. I mean, everything comes back to those simple, beautiful teachings of his, right? Be kind, uh, show respect to others. Don't pretend, don't be a phony. Don't be an mm -hmm. egomaniac, right? What a beautiful teaching. I love that he set the world on its ear too with that teaching because they were so phony and pretentious, right? People around him. Yeah, um, gorgeous Roddy Chrome has a question here. What is your opinion of Kirlian, Kirlian photography, Kirlian, oh. I don't know, and yeah. photography of auras? Well, and I can, wait, before you answer that, I just want to say, Des, Drace, if you're watching, I know you had a question all the way at the beginning, and I can't scroll back that far. So if you're still here, please put your question again in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, it's a real thing. I think it only captures a part of the nuance, though, because when I look at auras, what I, they look like cloud bands of color floating over each other. So those stories about the chakras and the color bands, that's a stylized representation of something that's much more nuanced. So every uh, aura is like a kaleidoscope of colors that wheel and turn and bloom. Uh, they can be bright or dim. Uh, Karelian photography captures, in my view, a, a narrow iteration of that. A simple translation of that. Yeah, it's a real thing. Uh, it's an electromagnetic spectrum capturing um, a detail on it. It's, a, it's like a sound in a sentence in a foreign language. It's one of the words or two of the words in the sentence or the paragraph of a foreign language. It's absolutely real, though. Mm -hmm. Don't know much about it. <clears throat> Do you believe Mara is real? I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? Uh, gosh, I wish I knew what that was. It sounds like a Buddhist, uh, part of the Buddhist pantheon, which is in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, there's a bunch of saints and Buddhas and iterations of Buddhas. Uh, I don't know. People come to me for years. People have said, is, you know, Archangel Michael real? Well, heck if I know, you know, people say they, that he speaks to him. Probably he does. I don't know. Um, I think that structuring a reality past the third dimension is dangerous because we're just building castles in the air, really. And we each have direct experience, which is, I'm positive, authentic. Uh, but would I tell someone what their experience should be? That would be hubris on my part, I feel, because I don't know their experience. Um, do I believe in the Maitreya Buddha? The, I don't know. I'm, I believe more in electromagnetic free uh, theoretical physics than I do in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, which has angels and devils. But humans incorporate angels and devils into daily life, so we don't need to put them in the spirit world. They're right here on the planet. <laughs> okay, so um, what have, like, what has your experience or your studies taught you about the way that God, like, interacts in the world? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think he does miracles? Mm -hmm. Do you think of course, he... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think there's large and small miracles, and I think we could all experience a lot more miracles if our minds were more quiet. And I feel the reason that people don't heal uh, is that they tell a story too much. 
Uh, I know some lovely people who are physically handicapped. I have a close friend. I love her to pieces. She's one of the coolest people I've ever known. And she's so obsessed with her story of illness, she can't possibly heal. But I wish I could tell her if you just widen back and allow in silence, allow your body to do whatever it does, you could heal and you could experience miracles. But since you can't hear that, I can't say that to her. I wish I could say it. I want her to know. Um, I think that God is always intruding on the, but we our free will is top, right? Our free will prevails here. God put us in the playground, said, what can you do in the playground? What can you create in the playground? How can you interact with each other? How can you learn from each other? Um, I feel that God is speaking every moment of every day in everything in the creation, including all of our negative experiences, because they reflect back to us what we could learn from or need to change. My personal practices, when I encounter a difficulty, I say, how can I respond with more grace? So instead of going, well, that person, blah, 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 and they said that, and these guys did it, and they shouldn't have done it, you know, that's all fourth dimensional argumentational thinking. It doesn't save people's souls and it brings no joy and it creates a lot of mm -hmm. suffering. So I try to slip out of it to what can I learn from this moment? What would my angels like me to see that I haven't perceived? How can I give the other person the benefit of the doubt? How can I give myself the benefit of the doubt? That's my practice every minute of every day. And I've also read Anna Freud where she talks about projection, um, displacement and all the neurotic behaviors. I've studied psychology a lot too. And I know that we're all, you know, we have certain liabilities built into our nature. So if this is the creation that we are, that we're inherently unkind to each other and inherently egotistical and violent, and that's what I see when I read history and philosophy and metaphysics and sociology, et cetera. Um, given all that, how can I change that? How can I improve on that? How can I help heal that? How can I show the light? How can I bring God into it? Um, that's my practice every minute of every day. And that's the answer to the problem of suffering. And again, that's where Buddhism coalesces with the core of Christian concept. You know, would Jesus have a problem with any of those things? Of course not. What is said about Jesus and who Jesus were, the jury's out. But it doesn't matter because you can have a direct experience of the grace of God wherever you are, and God's always breaking into the experience as long as we're in stillness. That's why I'm so enthusiastic about meditation. When I'm in stillness, I experience the grace of God, which reinforces my enthusiasm to be a Christian and my joy to be a Christian. And I'd like to behave like Christ if I could. If I had a way to do that, I would do it in a heartbeat. I want to. I can't hear you anymore, sweetie. Oh, sorry. I ah. muted myself. I feel like one of the beautiful principles of Buddhism is the idea that like attachment is what causes suffering. And yeah. so, you know, and this does, like you said, it, it it goes with Christian belief because, you know, it's like it, it scripture says, don't love the world or anything in the world. Right. right. Be in the world, and, but not of it. Right. So it, it is when we have like ideas about how our lives should go yeah. that we suffer when it doesn't go that way. Yeah. You know, and so if you kind of like accept reality as it is. Yeah. And then you just, you know, you're not attached to reality having to be a certain way. Yes. So anyway, that's, that's one of the things that helps me. And, um, to, just even brilliant. actually mm -hmm. brilliant comment. Yes. And uh, we also have to be conscious. I had a huge epiphany one day when I realized a whole lot of suffering is self-created because it's the mind spinning after its own beliefs and demands. And I think that's when people become angry and they lash out at others. And that's a, a problem inherent in us. But what if we can transcend all that and become more virtuous in spite of those weaknesses and then inspire others to do the same? Isn't that what Buddha would ask us to do? Isn't that what Jesus would ask us to do? Isn't that what God would love for us to do? What if we could just do that? That's what I want to do, right? And see that my suffering yeah. is always based on contingencies. When I suffer, I'm a restless soul. I'm always mm -hmm. going to and fro in the world. I'm restless. I'm impatient. I get cranky that I don't can't get more information because I'm seeking it voraciously. I just say, yeah, well, tomorrow will be a different day. I'll probably do better tomorrow. 
um, and just allow it to be what it is. And my theory is we're changing our DNA with these um, adjustments in consciousness. I don't know if you've read the book, um, Angels of Our Better Nature, which is based on the notion that we're evolving our DNA toward a, a more glorified, less violent race. Um, and I think that's what God would like for us to do. But I think it's our playground. And if we create glory and offer it to God, then everyone celebrates together in this lifetime or some other in the future. And I sometimes have dreams that we'll gather together and celebrate these times and go, hey, remember when that happened? And we got through it together. It's just a theory. Don't know if I'm right. Might be wrong. Cool. Okay, um, here's a question from Drace. Has Glenda come across the work of Stephen Batchelor? And if she has, what does she think about what he says about living with the devil? I haven't run across that, uh, but I think there's a devil innate in us in our violence. Uh, I think that we're all impatient creatures. And I think that we're, you know, we have a reptilian brain in there and there's violence inherent in our nature. Um, I remember one day when I was just at work years ago and I said, angels, um, because they're always close by and I can ask questions and get very clear answers. And that's how I've worked as a psychic for decades um, and tell people th secrets no one knows. Right. So I trust the voice, that information. Um, but I said, angels were inherently violent and that's why people behave so aggressively. And they're like, yes, yeah, sweetie, that's right. Um, so I think that the shadow is with us everywhere we go and we all have shadow. Instead of being angry at shadow or trying to drive it away or blaming others when they express shadow, it's better to just walk softly. So when I see someone doing something or behaving in a way that bugs me, then I'm like, oh, well, I'll just distract myself. Um, I distract myself from the, the ill behavior of others because I know that if they could do better, they would. That's another one of my theories in motion is I don't I think everyone's searching for meaning. I think people are they're looking for power on the soul level. And I think that's why people have wanted to be king or emperor or lord of the, you know, MTV or whatever. We're seeking that feeling of power that we can manage our suffering with grace and not be overwhelmed by it and not be wrong and not be stupid and not be made a fool of and not be alone. And so if we're all seeking for that and if we give ourselves peace by learning how to transcend suffering, which is, again, what Buddhist, Buddhism is so good at helping with. Um, my Roshi said that your highs and lows will level out when you meditate. He said, from the first time on the meditation cushion, you transform every karma you will ever have in any lifetime. I was so blown back when he said that. And I believe he's right. Um, you soften things and then the suffering becomes less painful, less difficult to bear. It's, hard, it's easier to bear the mistakes and weaknesses of others and your own, too. And so I think Buddha and Christ, if they were to have lunch together, would have they would have a good time with that. Um, I'd like to be an adequate representative of both belief systems, if, if possible, and shed light for others and help show a light through suffering because it is innate in the human condition. It's a real thing. Um, Scott would like to know what is Glenda's form of meditation? Mm -hmm. So my favorite thing and on of all the good things in the world, the world's full of beautiful things and it's a garden of Eden as far as I'm concerned, in spite of the suffering that we experience here. Um, I was taught to meditate Zazen style, uh, which is my Roshi explained just sitting. So all the stuff they do in Hinduism and transcendental meditation and stuff, it's too fancy for me. I'm not fancy. Um, I just sit. Um, I like, uh, I recommend for beginners things like listening to ambient music and setting a timer for 10 or 15 minutes and just let your mind drift. And you'll, you can start to get real breakthroughs in that way. Um, and if your mind is chattering, mind's chatter. You just say, huh, oh, well, what happens when I sit on the cushion in a room full of people who are meditating, you experience a peace that's beyond understanding. I can't even explain it. It's pure bliss. Because everyone's seeking the silence, the beauty of, you know, that ineffable fifth dimension, ninth dimension, whatever the space is. I don't know. But when you sit there and your mind settles into the stillness, you become part of all it is and you can feel it. It's glorious. Uh, and then the gong rings and the session's over. And it's like, oh, dang, it's over. Um, and I don't sit in a zendo anymore. But I seek that perfect silence and I just let my mind drift toward it because the noise will silence, it will still down. I used to dash into the zendo with my mind racing with all the junk that I had to do, whatever, sit on the cushion and I'm like, okay, it's okay, there are thoughts and it's okay, it's okay, there are thoughts. And my mind would settle and settle and settle. 
And sometimes it would go to perfect quietude. And sometimes it would go to a vision. And sometimes it would go to an existential reality that was not here. And my angels would show me this thing that changed my whole life. Um, so it's okay to get meditation wrong and screw it up. Um, ambient music with a timer. And just if your mind drifts, good. If it doesn't drift, it doesn't matter. Because you'll get better at it as you practice. And I just practice. And sometimes my mind is busy and sometimes it's quiet. And I, my goal is to line myself up with the part of me that's not here on planet Earth. Somewhere in the universe, wherever that is. Sometimes I see myself intersecting with that being that is beyond time and space that's still me. And then just going ah, and seeing the light flood out into the universe. And sometimes I just listen to the ambient music uh, and wait for the timer to ring and go into stillness. I think if you practice that way, your suffering will attenuate. You'll feel more patient. You won't feel so overwhelmed. Things that have bothered you for your whole life will start to dissolve away. So I recommend that because it really works, and that's why the Buddha taught it. And the lineage that I learned this from, by the way, comes straight from the Buddha and the White Plum lineage 2,500 years ago. It's a student. To, it's a teacher-to-student practice going back 2,500 years to the Buddha himself, a room of people with a teacher going back. And that's what I'm sharing is what I learned from my teacher in the white plum lineage, going back all the way to the Buddha. So did you say you have a specific amount of time that you meditate? Like, do you set set a, a timer or something like that? 10 minutes. Um, and I'm impatient. I'm always racing around like a maniac, honestly. Uh, so I set the timer because I can't wait to get into the day. Set the timer for about 10, 15 minutes. The Roshi taught us, because I thought, oh, I should do like marathons and meditate for 12 hours. And there is a practice like that. It's called Seshin, where you sit in the rainy season traditionally in Japan and you meditate that way. Um, but he said you just need 20 minutes. Is 15 or 20 minutes is sufficient to create a, a chain of action where your consciousness begins to shift on its own. My goal is to hold the softness through the day as I move through my day and go into the quiet. Um, and just respond to life. As, and I say, hmm, is that so? There's a Zen proverb about that. When I react, I go, hmm, I'm reacting. I don't know. And I just let it go. And so I try to hold a meditative consciousness during the course of my day. But that's after 10 or 15 years of practice that I can do that. It's just something to aim for that will bring peace. That's why I bring it up. Okay, here's a question. It's changing the subject. But if Glenda accepts Jesus the person, then does she accept the Bible he taught? This is from EGL, Edge L. Um, <clears throat> so, and I guess I kind of wanted to ask about that because mm -hmm. there are some places where Jesus talks about judgment. Right. And like, so do you like take some of what Jesus taught in the Bible and not take other things that he taught? Mm, such a great question. So the jury's out on that like so much else. So when I was obsessed when I was 11, well, what did Jesus really said versus, say versus what did people say that he said versus they wrote it down 40 years later. So how did they remember? Plus they were Jews anyway. And they had these other stories. And then you have the apocryphal books. Um, I just am interested in the core of his teachings. I think like all the rest of us, my impression, and I could be wrong, is that he awoke in his ministry and he found God and he went right to the core of this eternal son that he was. I could be wrong, but my feeling is he was a man of his time and place. He was called to a work. And as he did the work, he awakened to this self that was transcendent from beyond time and space, this universal creator son. And that's why he said, my father and I are one. So he said what he knew based on parts of him. I mean, I agree with the Byzantines who said that he had a nature that was part human and part divine. Um, I can see why they had that argument for five or 600 years and excommunicated each other over it. And um, The jury's out because I don't know. But uh, my direct experience of, of him and his teaching is that he was beyond all of that. And he talked to people in a language they could understand. And I think that the transcription of his teaching is accurate and inaccurate at the same time. Um, I was reading a book. It's called Jesus Through the Eyes of the Middle East. And it talks about all the ways that the story of him born in a manger in a stable in a cave was all probably true because of the way people lived at his time. 
Um, I don't know. I'm only interested in the core of his teaching and being like that the core teaching that he exemplified and that saints throughout the ages have exemplified. Um, I, I don't know because I can't tell if that was a later transposition or if that was the human part of him speaking. Um, my experience of God is that God helps us see who we are, which if we have a negative life experience might look a whole lot like judgment and self-condemnation. And I also think people judge based on their own ability uh, to judge and they tend to transpose that onto God. So we tend to project our stories onto God in a way that has nothing to do with God. That's something I recognized in my teens. People were telling a story of God that matched their own view. Oh, those guys are going to hell because they're bad. Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not. I think it's just uh, human consciousness and our stories about God evolve over the centuries and they get a little more sophisticated with time. And the best answer is to search for answers innately instead of argue about doctrines. Because since I can't ask God in person while I'm human in form, I have to trust that I'll be satisfied with the answers when I hear them. I also want to live a life that's exemplary enough that if I were to be judged, I wouldn't have a lot to hide from. I had a prophetic dream about that when I was a kid. Uh, I went to St. Peter's Gates and he said, uh, he wasn't there, but a, a bureaucrat was there, a guy with some glasses and a clipboard. Uh, I don't even really believe in those gates, but I dreamt about it all the same. And he goes, oh, yeah, we have a list of people who are going to be admitted to heaven today. And I was like, good, I'll be admitted. I've been a good person. Yes, yes, like everybody helps for. And he went through the clipboard and my name wasn't there. And then I had this realization I wasn't on the list. And he said, well, we have a policy here in heaven. If you can prove just cause, you can be admitted to heaven even if you're not on the list. And I said, what, what is the, you know, what's the just cause? He said, what have you done only for others and not for yourself? Not for the recognition of anybody else, not because it was a rule, not because it's going to make you look good. What have you done that's just for others? And so every day I try to do things like that. Let people in in traffic say a kind word to a stranger, smile at somebody to try to spread that light of God because I had that dream years ago. Is there a judgment? I, I like to think, I, my theory is we're judging ourselves and others as we go along and as we release judgment, we find God. That's my real theory, of my real mm. answer to that question. Maybe that happened to Jesus too, although we don't know. Mm. I wish I could be a fly on the wall. I still wish I could go back in time and see for myself what he taught. You know, there's somebody watching, I don't know if he's still watching, but he's on my channel frequently. Anonymous One is what he calls himself. He he believes that God is evil for creating him because he he doesn't think it's right to create a being without their permission. Like, basically, like, you know, he, he's upset with the suffering that he's experienced in the world. Wow. And he wishes he could have not been born. Wow, that sounds like a lot of suffering to experience. Um, wow, I feel a lot of compassion for that position. I wish I could give him a hug. Because uh, so, I, I, feel, I feel the truth of what he's saying, the depth of that. Um, the answer that I would have is my theory is that no one's here without choosing it. Um, we come into the playground knowing that we're going to be thrown in like a kid thrown into the deep water in the pool, and we have to learn how to swim. And I would say that uh, that problem of frustration will begin to fade with a little time on the meditation cushion. Because when the stillness comes in, the clamoring mind silences, and then there's peace, and the pain dissipates. So meditating even just a few minutes a day in silence and not being mad when the silence won't dissipate because it's just a practice and we're doing as best we can with crappy abilities, honestly, to be good, maybe that could attenuate a lot of that suffering because my personal suffering has diminished like 90% or more since I started meditating. I used to freak out about everything. I was worried sick. I was getting it wrong, doing the wrong thing. I freaked out about what people did and what they thought and da da da. And that's all gone away. I don't feel that way at all anymore except for a moment by moment that will pop in. I'll go, hmm, oh, there it is again. And I release it and it goes away. So I think that meditation would solve that suffering in a way that the question then itself would begin to dissolve. And you wouldn't feel so upset at being an existing being. 
So my my I wish I could hug you, my dear, because uh, I I used to feel overwhelmed in a similar way. I have to be honest. Hmm. You're muted again, sweetie. <laughs> you yeah. talked a little bit about your. Um interest i mean you've mentioned a few things about early christianity but that was one of the things that we were kind of talking about when we met yes. so could you share more about what your specific interest is in early christianity and what you've learned about your study of that time period yeah so what one of the things so i'm passionate about that and that's one of the things that pulled me out of christianity years ago because i was so frustrated it was so hard to get good information I'm like, I really think that St. Paul was wrong about this and this based on my hunch, but I don't know. And Paul didn't even know Christ in person. So he was speaking as a Greek, you know, I was like, I want to know what he said, not what they said. Right. So I'm passionate about that. And I wish I could know in person what he said. Um, but I, I can share with you an answer that I received about that. Uh, but I, so the answer that I, one of the things I've uncovered in my reading is that the people who knew Christ were capable of miracles after his passing. So the early apostles went around and they performed miracles. And I, I believe those are true stories. Just, just cause I can't perform a miracle right now doesn't mean that somebody else couldn't. And if he demonstrated the ability to do that as an eternal son of God, then of course that's a real thing. And who am I to question it? Um, just because people tell fairy tales doesn't mean that those are fairy tales, right? Um, another thing that really struck me is what I said before, that people happily sacrifice their lives in order to be associated with this being. So he was extraordinary. Um, the third thing is that people who knew him and knew those who knew him were soft and gentle and compassionate and powerful and enthusiastic. So they exemplified the virtues that we know Christ to have possessed. And that's something I've uncovered in my reading, but I can't wait to dig into the Apocrypha and see what I can find out there. Because um, a lot of, I think, what has come down to us is the people doing the best they can in later centuries based on reconciling old teachings. And I think there was a real sense in the third and fourth century, if they didn't get it right, they would go to hell. Um, and that's why they were so adamant about those positions. And I think those are carryovers from very ancient religious practices that really didn't have anything to do with Jesus. So that's something that's come through because not only have I studied early Christianity, but I've studied ancient religions of all kinds. And here's an interesting thought for the atheists to consider. Um, early religious buildings in the Americas, no one knows how old they are exactly. I can't remember. They're like 3000 BC, 2000 BC. There's these gods that are holding severed human heads and they have these ferocious expressions like... And I thought to myself, if that culture grew up independently of all the others in the world, why is their God so hateful and destructive? So I think one of the reasons I want to do a PhD in mimetic theory is to try to understand what in us creates a God that's hateful and destructive that we transpose onto any God, no matter what our faith is, anywhere in the world, any generation of time. Because I don't think that's God. I think that's a human story about human failing and suffering and anger and violence. Um, and I think Jesus was someone extraordinarily apart and he brought relief from that whole story. And that's why people were so thrilled to surround him such that he wanted to leave and go away and be by himself and have some privacy because they were so enthusiastic with the energy that he brought. I think he personified the experience of the universe of God in human form. And he was a miracle, a walking miracle. And people could, could feel that. That's why I wish I could be a fly on the wall and go listen to the Sermon on the Mount. What are the what are the the things from the Sermon on the Mount that you hold on to? I love this thought about the meek inheriting the earth. That's a really beautiful teaching um, because we all know if you study the world or history that the powerful prevail and every, the nice guys get their heads knocked off. I mean, read any history book in the world. Right. Um, and Christ was teaching that there's power in that soft approach. And that, again, corresponds with the meditative mind that says, I don't know. So there's, again, a place where those energies dovetail. So there's this beautiful, sweet spot that floats out in the universe 
where all beautiful ideas that you can feel and sense merge together in the presence of God and Jesus express some of those in language and those who followed him express some in language. And then you have these beautiful saints from the Middle Ages like Julian of Norwich that ex express some of that in language. And we flock to that because we're so hungry for relief from our trials and confusion and uncertainty. So it's a real thing, confusion and suffering and darkness, those are real. I also think to return to that question we talked about before about suffering and being angry that God created a, a suffering being, um, when you offer kindness to others, the suffering dissipates too. Don't you think so? When you offer so kindness, you don't feel so bad that you're a flawed being that screws up and the world is full of darkness. It starts to feel better. So kindness is a genuine antidote to suffering. Not letting people walk on you or being a patsy, but allowing things to unfold with patience and softness, waiting to see what will come next. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said the meek would inherit the earth. Because there's those studies that forgive people who forgive others find joy and find relief from their suffering. I think that all dovetails. It's all part of the same story, really. Interdisciplinary reality. Now, what, uh, I, I'm sorry, I lost my question. I can't decide if I want to ask you. Well, I guess I want to know, you mentioned that you believe Jesus is Savior. Do yes. you believe that he is God? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And but then I do you think if you were in the Middle Ages and you were sharing these ideas, would you have been? Oh, burn at the stake, of course. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, I believe I was there. I was in the Middle Ages and I was in a monastery. I, if I could be a desert father in the second century, poof, I would go right now. If my angels, if you know, a genie appeared and rubbed a lamp and said, you can have anything, I'd be like, I want to go back to the second century and live in the desert and meditate again. Um, but I'm pretty sure I did before. And I had the same questions and the same longings and the same, some of the same answers. Um because my nature is very monastic and sort of uh, ascetic by nature, I kind of live in a monastic way, sort of. Uh, I like to be in the world, but not of the world in many ways, and try to exemplify those same personality qualities that those saints had. Um, I've, I've often wondered how I would land on the, this in those questions, right? But I, I would like to think that I would land on the Buddhist side where something happens, there's an uproar, and, and the Buddhist saint is able to say, is that so? Um, there's a story about a guy, I'll tell it really fast. So this, um, a horse was wandering, and a farmer found him, and he said, pray, you know, praise be, praise the gods have sent me this horse, yay, yippee, yippee. Um, and he told, uh, he told the Zen master, and the Zen master said, is that so? And then his son fell off the horse. Uh, his son rode on the horse all over the plain, and then he fell off the horse and broke his leg, and his father cursed the gods. And the Zen master said, is that so? And then he was laid up with a broken leg when the corvée came through the village, and they scooped up every able-bodied man to take him to the front and fight a war. And the man praised God, and the saint just said, is that so? So that's that suffering question, reacting, 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 reacting. And so humans react, and I react because I'm human. But I'd like to practice not reacting. And that's where, again, my Buddhism helps me to be a better Christian, to not react to everything that people do or say or don't say. Oh, they should have da-da-da-da-da-da. Well, that's a fourth dimensional argument. I want to live in the fifth dimension where people are fine the way they are and God knows what's going on and is guiding the world with his hidden hand in intelligent design or whatever God is. I wouldn't say God has this form or that form. How would I know? I'm a human being and I live on planet Earth and I don't, I don't know who God is. But I know God is. And I know we are a part of God, that spark of divine fire, like the Quakers always said. You know, the nature, we're part of the nature of God. Can we give glory to the creation? That's now, do you think, and this is a question from B.S. Lewis, is everyone God? I've always had problems with that. I think that sounds like hubris. Um, because when I read history, I read about the lords of the Middle Ages and they thought they were all that. And I think they're idiots. Um, I think that the ego is the enemy of God. I think the ego is the voice of the self acting out in the world, trying to control it. And that when we say we're part of God, usually the ego is speaking, not the self. I think the only place to find God is in perfect stillness. And that's when the ego isn't talking. 
So this whole new age thought about, oh, God, this and that, I, I find that just as irreverent as people in the Middle Ages who thought that they were all that. And they were just egomaniacal big shots, right? I, I don't like that teaching at all. It smacks of ego and hubris. Mm. So you feel like there's definitely like a creator and the creation and we are the creation, but that we're like, we are connected to God. Probably. Is that kind of an accurate? Yeah, I don't know. That's that gray area where I have a lot of theories. Like if I made a list of my theories, I'd be like Martin Luther with all the theories and nail them onto the church door. That would be one of the theories that we're part of the creation. But in the human mind playing the game, I'm inevitably going to tell the story incorrectly and I'm inevitably going to react and be uh, driven by ego at times. And I'm inevitably going to be confused and lost in the darkness at times. And so the game is set up for me to figure out how to win in spite of myself. Well, how would I not want to live that game? That game is a, a joy. And if I give glory to God by living the game with grace and blessing others, why wouldn't I sign up for that? That sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? And what if you can do more good here in the darkness than you could in a thousand worlds filled with light? That is for me the answer of that old uh, medieval question about the omnipotence of God and the problem of suffering. If God set up a special space for us to shine light in the darkness and do more good thereby than in a thousand worlds filled with light, I'd be all over that. I'd sign up for that again and again. Sounds like fun. That's a beautiful way to think about it. Um, now, I, I, I'm, guys, I'm not going to, I am, have one final question. Don't put up any more questions because I'm going to let Glenda go here pretty quick. I'm going to ask this one from the audience and then I'm going to ask her final question. And we can have her on again if anybody um, would like to hear more of her perspective. So Drace says, does Glenda think evolution is true? Also, how old is the universe? And mm. and if she would like to learn more about Mara, check out Mara Sutra in Pali, the Pali Canon. Mm. I think it's, he said earlier in a comment that Mara is the equivalent of Satan. Oh, yeah. Well, it sounds a little like Kali because I studied Hinduism when I was a kid. I was always buried in that topic. Um, mm -hmm. I've studied it some and it sounds like people's best effort at expressing a truth. So that's how I feel about Hinduism. There's a lot of uh, ineffable wisdom in there, too. I'm not saying that Hinduism is not a beautiful faith. I believe that it is. Um, so what was the question about God? It was, a oh, great do you think evolution is true oh, yeah. and how old is the universe? Oh yeah, absolutely. But I think it's all elements working together. When I was a kid, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Please help me know if, evol if we're evolved from apes. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And the answer that I received after a while was when your mind's expanded to answer the question, the answer will come to you. And so I was in a science museum a decade after that. And I thought, oh, consciousness evolved to meet the place where God um, interacted with consciousness and established the principle of free will. And my angels are like, yes, that's right. And I was like, what? Because it was an answer to the question I'd had at least a decade before. So if I do very much believe in evolution. I also believe evolution is a dogma in its own right now. I think that Evolution doesn't answer every question because I recommend a book called uh, Cosmos Sapiens, which deals with that question in great detail, detail with a lot of integrity for people who have questions about evolution. Um, I would say God uses every tool to create and expand and evolution's part of it, of course. And did we come from other life forms? You betcha. Is it the only answer? Absolutely not. So I guess, Glenda, my final question Isn't is, fun? <laughs> I, I, hey, I'm having a blast. And just like our first conversation, I really enjoy yeah. talking to you. And I'm so glad you came on. Um, for those who are watching who maybe don't have a belief in Jesus Christ or maybe don't recognize him in the way that you recognize him, what mm -hmm. do you want people to know about Jesus Christ? What I want people to know is that God loves you no matter who you are, what you are, where you are, no matter what you've done or haven't done, you are loved, you are loved, you are loved, you are loved. And Jesus is the manifestation and expression of that truth. And I think the reason people fasten on to Jesus, because that's a way we can have access to God directly or indirectly or however we can find God. As I said, I put my Christian faith on the shelf for years because I just was, my brain was swimming with all these things I couldn't answer. But I still knew God existed and loved me and the creation and all of us. So it's okay if you don't believe in Jesus. You don't have to believe in Jesus to be loved by God. 
Um, if you could trust that God put you here and you put yourself here in order to have a grand, glorious experience, um, and if you would trust yourself to find good answers and allow your life experience to reveal the truth, I would ask you to ask God to help you find your way to a truth that works for you in his own time or her own time or whatever, um, at the perfect time, and that you would open to answers that will come filtering in and watch for them in funky places, you know, a bird song or music on the radio or an overheard conversation or a book you find. Um, I've had the experience of the book falling off a shelf in a bookshop uh, at my feet for no reason. And of course, I bought the book and took it home. So be open to answers and also don't shut out answers that are unfamiliar. So when an idea pops in, if, you're, if your angels bring an idea to you through a crack of least resistance and you go, oh, that can't be true. Well, just be silent and discover if it makes sense in some other context. Let your mind, mind move to new answers. And I feel if you do that, you will inevitably come to feel loved and supported by the universe in some form, whatever form that may be for you. God willing. Thank you so much. And um, there's some people just saying you were a great guest and I'm looking for the one. Yeah. Uh, Brian Stevens says you were a great guest. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much for being here and let's do it again. I would love to do it again. And I would love to talk about all the reasons why I don't believe in the Christian God, even though I believe so much in God for all the atheists, because I have compassion for atheists. I know there's a reason for being an atheist just because I'm a believer doesn't mean I, I think atheists are wrong. I don't. Cool. Okay. Bye, Thanks everybody. For Thanks for being a great audience, too. God go with you. Yep. Yeah.